Good day, class. How are you? I'm here um, in Starbucks this week saying hello and going over this week's uh, lessons. I don't think I'm going to spend too much time um, on any one thing, but as you can well see this week, week six, apocalyptic texts in the New Testament, book of Revelation. So um, this week you're really going to want to focus on uh, defining what apocalyptic literature is, noting its uniqueness and characteristics, summarizing principles of interpreting these kind of texts, and then finally explaining the connection of signs between John and Revelation. So um, the reading, pretty self-explanatory. And uh, the, the one additional thing with reading this week is to watch this um, this video, pretty long. It's a, it's a full lecture by, um, by Beale. And and that'll uh, hopefully be a really good um, resource for you to, to really understanding Revelation as a whole. Um, excuse the fact that whoever plugged this and put Revelations, never say Revelations, because it's not Revelations, it's the Revelation of John. So um, that's, a, that's a big faux pas. Um, anyway. Let's go over the assignments. So this this week, 6-2, the repeti repetition in Revelation paper. Uh, in two to three pages, why does the book of Revelation use repetition? So there's a lot of repetition in the book. Why? In light of what you've read, explain why John would repeatedly mention the same idea, specifically in terms of how repetition influences interpretation and how repetition benefits readers. Uh, so, so it can uh, a reader when something is repeated, it has an effect on the reader, right? Um, and then it also helps us in terms of interpretive. Uh, processes. When something is repeated, it helps us uh, in various ways, which um, the the reading and the the, the lecture will, will point out. But uh, you know, one of the things is is when something's repeated over and over again, you you tend to clarify what the main idea is and what what the author was trying to to uh, to come across. Um, you you may address this question generally. Um, meaning in terms of why the book uses repetition. So you can you can answer that question from a general sense, or you can actually uh, give examples and use sp a specific passage of maybe five to ten verses to illustrate it. And then we do want you to, to make sure not to use Revelation 4, 6 to 11. Another faux pas, Revelation 4 does not have 13 verses. It has 11 verses. <laughs> I've got it open here. So you can see here... Um, there, there's some the repetition in here about the living creatures, holy, 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 um, and uh, so they they talk about that one. You're not to use that one as your example. It is a good example. It can help you in terms of forming your ideas, but um, in your paper, please don't use that one because that's already in your reading. We want you to use a fresh example if you're going to use a specific example. Um, again, if you don't use a specific example of you know five to ten verses somewhere to illustrate your points, um, you can speak more generally of how it's used as a whole in the book, okay? Um, so again, two to three pages, that would be double-spaced, size 12 font, Times New Roman, as usual, okay? Now, 6-1, this is letters in Revelation paper. So in this one, we're starting um, with just a half-page reflection, meaning um, based on, on the study in, and... Uh, reading that you had thus far. Why do you think the book of Revelation begins with epistolatory? I don't even know how to say that, to be honest with you. I never used that word. Epistolatory? Epistolatory? Epistle-like reading or didactic material, meaning, um, you know, most people, when they think of Revelation, they've got a certain form of, well, that it's weird, and it has all these weird metaphors and and dream-like or vision-like creatures that John portrays, but the reality is is that it starts with this didactic material. We, we talked about last week how epistles have didactic material, which is which is really material that's meant, you know, the letter's meant for teaching. So, you know, John wrote to the churches, it's a teaching uh tone or genre of, of writing. So Revelation kind of continues that didactic um, style, even though he, he in that, uh, portrays or uh, recounts a uh, very vivid vision that he's had, of course. Um, but knowing that the book starts in a very much uh, similar didactic or epistle style um, genre tone,
Uh, how does that shape your understanding of the entire book? Okay, so this first half, half page, you're going to reflect on, okay, now what I know about that, what is that telling me? So, so if I was going to sit you down, you're not going to use other sources for this, but assuming that you, you might need to refresh yourself on the significance of epistolatory or didactic style um, biblical writing. Which, with what you know about that, the fact that Revelation begins with that, if I was going to ask you just to sit down and reflect for a half a page on what's the significance or how does that under, shape your understanding of the book of Revelation, meaning what's the purpose of it? If you if you know that that's how it starts, that's how the tone is set for the whole book. What does that mean? So so if you were going to say how, how does that shape your understanding of how we're supposed to use the book of Revelation and what it was in, what was its intended purpose? That's what you're doing. And then why do you think this opening material, meaning the letters to the churches, is sometimes underemphasized in some people's perception of the book as a whole? So that's the that's the the next. Uh, part of it. So really this this whole this whole assignment should be about a page probably when you're done answering it. Um, that's I mean even if it was single spaced. If if you're only doing double space it might extend into two pages. Uh, but again not a long paper and and more of a reflection paper that's that you're not doing research on but it's based on on your reading and understanding so far. Um, so I want to see some deep reflection um, but uh, again, that's not going to take you much time because that's just you stopping and thinking about you know, your own understanding of these things so far in your reading. Um, why do you think this might be? Okay. So again, we're not going to give tons of feedback on that uh, on your papers as much as if you completed it and it sounded like you were going on the right track. That's great. But um, we'll probably give you a summary at the end of where we're hoping to go. Um, and it may be a good example of what someone else did. So um, that's pretty straightforward. And then your discussion this week is um, on Beale, and so you obviously have to watch that uh, lecture in its entirety. Still, you're saving time. You're not coming to class for three hours this week. So uh, watch and enjoy. I know it's, it's sometimes a little dry, dry to watch an old man lecture on a video, which is why we don't do it on a weekly basis. So when we do um, post something that you have to watch, sorry for the background noise, when we do post something that you have to watch, play, pay close attention to it because we have found that it's that solid of content. Um, the delivery may not be entertaining, but the content is so good that we've we've required you to watch, you know, a full um, length lecture, lecture like that. So pay attention and enjoy that. I think it should be really helpful for you. But he discusses this distinction between literalism and symbolism. The important thing here is to know that there's a difference, right? He discusses literalism and symbolism. How does he use both in his reading of Revelation? Meaning, um, is it act well, one to come to the idea that this isn't just an issue of when you read the book of Revelation, is it literal or is it symbolic? Well, obviously the book has dynamics that are both literal and symbolic. And sometimes we, we, just, we just have such a skewed understanding of what symbolic means. Symbolic doesn't mean optional. Um, uh, or and, and necessarily, it doesn't mean we're always talking about instruction. So most times when Christians get into debates with other Christians or non-Christians, the, the, the issue is, oh, this is symbolic, so I don't actually have to do it unless I feel like it. Most of the time, it's really, it's not, it's, it's, you'll see how that discussion is kind of silly if, if you really understand what's, what's going on here. Um, and just because something is symbolic doesn't mean that it's less important um, or less pointed at its audience, right? So you'll see some of the examples he gives with that. Um, so, so the main question you're using in your discussion board is how does Beale use both both literalism and symbolism in his reading of Revelation. And do you agree or disagree with his approach? So he, I, th I think most are going to understand that yes, there is some literal, I mean, there's definitely literal uh, literalism and there's definitely symbolism in the book. But how do you actually uh, agree with the approach of how to utilize those things? Or if there's a disagreement of what is literal or what is symbolic, that's, there's an opportunity for you to interact with the class on that and to have a zestful discussion um, on the topic. So um, you're, you're basically saying, how does he use both in his reading? How do you agree or disagree with Beale directly? And then 
explaining why, and then interact, obviously, with your classmates. So pretty straightforward. Um, in his book, one of his books, where did I put that? Um, there is... Um, he talks about this, the name of his book. I forget the name of his book. doesn't matter. But uh, uh, he talks a little bit about this, this concept. The literal figurative opposition does serve us rather well. So one may ask what the problem is exactly. Nothing except that we run the danger of separating the forms of speech from their purposes. Uh, and the way we have come to use these opposing terms, the literal is too closely tied to the referential and objective purposes of speech, while the figurative is linked to subjective, expressive, and decorative purposes. And that's what he's basically saying, that what we've done with those two terms, right? The literal, we suppose, is the language of science, scholarship, and the workaday world, while the figurative is the language of self-expression, beautiful crafting, and perhaps even the powerful affecting of audiences. However, as plausible as it may seem on the face of it, this is an erroneous and even dangerous set of connections. Basically, if you define and understand those terms that way in the reading of Scripture that way, you're, you're in a dangerous um, uh, territory, okay? Uh, it distorts our understanding of where true expressiveness comes from, and perhaps more importantly, it misdirects our thinking about where good ideas come from. In using the literal figurative distinction, we need to come to understand that the literal does not mean reference to hard fact as opposed to imagination, or even objective as opposed to subjective understanding. It does not even mean language that is not metaphorical. And the reason is that many metaphors have died, or at least become tamed and receded themselves into the literal. The literal is perhaps best understood as a designative, designative, sorry guys, I can't read, uh, as opposed to new naming language. All right, so, so um, th th that's just giving you kind of an example of, of what he gets into, I, I don't know if he specifically mentions these words in his lecture. Again, just to clarify, this is not part of your reading this week. Um, I, I just, because we gave you a lecture that you have to watch, um, I went directly to um, some writing that he's given on these that you don't have to read, but at least for the sense of setting up the discussion, um, starts to touch on some of the things that he addresses in the, the topic of literal figurative, to start to get you in the mindset of what we're going to be doing with the discussion. So, um, in terms of the discussion, you're you're going to start to 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 hash that out and to make some uh, make some conclusions about how that affects your reading of Revelation. So as you'll as you'll see, like you know, our goal for this 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 course, especially with Revelation, isn't for you to to come away with, um, now I have studied the book of Revelation, I know everything about it, and I can now tell you about it. That's not the goal. The goal is to um, set you up for success, so that as you begin your studies of Revelation from this point forward, you now have the tools to be successful to make solid biblical arguments, and to teach it accordingly, and to give those that you are teaching, or those you're studying with, the tools necessary to, to not make, um, you know, foolish or uninformed decisions about what the, the, the book is saying, okay? So have some fun with that. Hope you guys have a great week. Talk to you soon. Bye.